So that was an, an outstanding dialogue describing uh, some, of the, some of the challenges. And I think the consistent theme between virtually all the speakers is it depends uh, in terms of uh, how are you going to apply the questions. But if we could perhaps quantify the it depends a bit more, would, be, would we be more comfortable with it? So in the case for the first box, what expectations or preferences providers and patients be expected to have regarding benefits and adverse effects of study intervention? So if, if we had a better sense of, of measuring what that potential bias could be and balance that with the potential benefit that you could theoretically expect, if we could do the delta on that and figure out, okay, well, in this scenario, it looks like expectations could trump the, the pur purported benefit, would we be more comfortable just using this framework? And I'll just start with you, John. So if I, I just want to make sure I have the question right, which, which is with each one of these, if you could put a scale or quantification right. and then validate that if it's six out of 10 or below you, blind if it's yeah something to make this more operational perhaps if we're gonna how might those preferences expectations influence these things how are you gonna do that with a potential benefit so um, so so personally I would think that maybe the quantification may have the opposite effect in, in that we we would maybe be at a higher risk of making the wrong decision because you inappropriately chose the quantification, if that makes sense. And it, it has a little bit to do with the entire design of what you're trying to do. Because for one thing, the blinding can't necessarily be separated out from whether you're randomized. And so then as, you, as, you, as they start to cross over, your ability to then quantify that may be, dif may be difficult. And then the numbers may mean something different based upon the differences in what your question is and what your method is, I guess. Um, so what I work- experience a little bit from the self studies to exactly. see the differences. Exactly, so to see the differences and then to say there, this is the question we want to answer here and this is the question we want to answer here. And I guess maybe it's just uh, my tired mind from getting up at three in the morning and driving here this morning, but the, 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 the idea of quantifying is kind of daunting to me. I agree completely with respect to um, when trying to quantify. I think the, the thought of trying to quantify is daunting. I don't think we can. I, don't think, I think there are so many things that can play into the, that quantification that I would not feel confident in, in my ability to quantify and make an informed decision based on all of these uh, things that I may think to be true. So I, my, my bias is I don't think we can quantify. I agree. And when I think of, I'm always we're a leery of trying to introduce false precision into, uh, you know, that we feel better if we're able to put a number on it, whether it means anything or not. So to the extent that uh, one can do that, I think it's, making us feel better about making a decision that may not be based on something real. Right. And and for me, it still comes down to, uh, and, and Nancy phrased this well, is, well, what is the implication for the decision that we're trying to make? And if we don't keep that top of mind, then I think we're lulling ourselves into uh, thinking that we're doing more for, you know, that we're making a better decision than we might otherwise be making. And I agree with all the above speakers. I think that some of the ideas here we can address through stronger designs. So like the likelihood that benefit, beneficial or adverse events would be reported or observed. You should be able to address most of those concerns in a reasonably strong study where either you have, I mean, this, the simplest way to check what people are doing. So you have objective measurements. You can check whether they're taking treatments. You can check whether they've been to hospital. There are a lot of ob objective ways we can do this. I agree that this not only gives you a false sense of confidence by measuring this, but you are not taking into account all the ways human nature can defeat a trial. 
I mean, I think of the Mr. Fit trial, smoking cessation, showed, you know, it's just harmful, right? Because everybody started, you know, the control arm knows what the, what the study is and can take more healthful behaviors. So we need to, um, I think we need to step back and stop thinking we have such ultimate control over everything, and particularly that the blinding tool is what does it. I, I'm, I'm not I'm gonna, I don't have anything to add. I thought those comments were all great. Yeah, I, I don't really have a lot to add either. Um, I, I mean, one approach could be, um, and I'm not a statistician, but you know, one approach after the fact, when you have a trial result and you say, how bad would the bias interjected from whatever source, and this is not just your first box, but from whatever source, how, how bad and what, and what direction would it have to be to essentially nullify my result or flip it the other direction? It still requires a judgment. It requires a judgment of, is that reasonable, right? So it, it's not that one gets away from judgment, um, but it, it might be conceptually and psychologically easier to handle that than to put a false number or a, you know, a false sense of security on a, on a certain number um, of trying to quantify things a priori. I don't know if that will work or not, but it's just an idea. But I guess that does get to the point that would be, it's important to have that longitudinal fault so you can see those, those differences between each arm of the study, particularly when it was unblinded, so you can see if systematic differences did take place in terms of transparency. Greg, go ahead. Sure. So um, my, my question, I, we'll start with, with Jim Smith, I guess, but other people may want to answer. So the, the note I wrote to myself as you were going through these questions was you were saying, these are all the right questions, and you might be a fool if you think you can answer them. <laughs> can I really say that? <laughs> That's what it, well, I, actually, I thought it was uh, pr pretty much on target, but, but the, the question, the question. Then I, I, then I said that. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, question, the question I wanted to ask, so, so the, the renal denervation study is sort of held up there as, as, as the ultimate humble sauce. You know, the ultimate, ooh, who would have thought, you know, that, you know, we didn't think we needed to blind people in that case, and once, we've, once people were blinded, we got a really different answer. So. My question is, in a, in a scenario like that, what, if any, is the value in tracing that back upstream and saying, where, how did we go wrong there? Is there just a global, you'd never know, or is there something that can be known by saying, in that trial, here's what I think happened, and we might be able to protect ourselves against that next time? I personally think that a autopsy of trials that don't go the way one expected can only be an incredibly valuable exercise. And we're probably not often resourced well enough to do that as much as we should. I would agree that that would be a best practice. I may, if, if I could also add, it, it may not just be for ones that gave you a fully surprising result. I think in general, we need to spend a little bit more time after we get the results backing up that continuum to look at our decisions and understand them a little bit better and do that impact. I think when you go through this list, sometimes it may be more impactful post to assess your own before you write the article so you can put your limitations down appropriately. So I'm wondering if we can narrow down the it depends space and um, um, by, by appealing to uh, some empirical data. So it's a question for Orly first, because I'm thinking about it in the context of your study. And full disclosure, I, I was on the, on the PCORnet end of hearing about your study as you were designing it. And, I, I, and on the basis of purely uh, gut factors, I thought, geez, this is a great study not to blind. But, but I don't have any evidence in, in, in favor of that. But could we uh, look at past behavior to see how big the, uh, the potential biases that, that you articulated might be. For instance, if we, if we could uh, examine um, uh, immunized versus unimmunized and ask, is there a, is there a difference in the uh, severity of illness at the time they're hospitalized or the time that clinicians initiate antiviral therapy or things that uh, that would give some insight into the, the 
the potential bias of knowing whether they received a high dose or low dose. Would, would that, would that um, kind of information be useful enough to weigh into the decision? Because I, 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 you're, you're extremely thoughtful in the way you said, here's what we were concerned about, and we made the decision that we should blind. And I, I, honestly, I can't, I can't say you're wrong, but I, I wonder whether there's data that we could have looked at, yeah, excuse me, you could have looked at that, that would help guide that kind of decision. So you bring up something that we had been struggling with is that this is an active, we have an active control, so everybody is vaccinated because it's, it's unethical to have an unblinded, uh, excuse me, an untreated or unvaccinated arm. So I think if you, um, if you take the people that are not vaccinated, those folks are always, are going to look different, and we know they look different than people that are vaccinated. And so how I would have a tough time trying to identify all the factors that I could control for, you know, that I could know I could control for in those unblind or unvaccinated individuals. Does that make sense? So, so there are some answers that aren't helpful. But it seems to me there, there would be some results that, that might be helpful. That is to the extent that... So you're right. The people who are immunized are very different from the people who aren't immunized. But if your <laughs> concern is how are clinicians or, or, the, or the participants themselves going to behave contingent on their behavior about knowing about immunization status. Um, to the extent that between immunized and non-immunized, you don't see important differences in care seeking or in management decisions. Uh, you, 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 might not, you might not see that at all, but if you did, that, that could be helpful and it would give you a, so, some confidence to say in this situation, Maybe we can choose not to blind. So it's just, just it's not a global solution, and it, it might have been a complete mm -hmm. waste of time to do it. But it seems to me between the you, you have legitimate concerns, and and I'm thinking, gosh, it, it, it sure is. Uh, it, it sure would have been nice. It would be great to have some evidence. It, but your your point, it, it's interesting because the point of doing more research was my point around the book of work versus the study. Um, and, and it's the concept of that you have a question that you're trying to answer the study, but you may end up having a challenge you're trying to understand, and you need five different types of studies. And so, so, so your point of one educates you on the next one, and it's the insight it generates, is something that we can't forget. Right, but we're talking about a different kind of prep to research, because I would turn to Nancy and say, Nancy, can you look at the history mm -hmm. of people who are immunized or not immunized in the way they're Modify. I'm not saying do another study, uh, do, do another prospective study. I'm thinking you might be able to look at the, at the, existing, body of, the existing body of data just to help inform, inform that. I think we will be able to um, because we, we know, at least in our, so we have 3,000 individuals that are enrolled right now, and 50% of those folks did not get vaccinated the previous year. And so 50-50, well, I think we will be able to maybe explore some of those issues. Um, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe. And just to follow up on that, Dr. Verdini, so you did say that there was some patients that it sounds like the blind was broken, so they were able to perceive what, oh, so nobody was able to perceive what, what they were on. I think people um, will always think that they know what, what they got because they may think, oh, that really hurt this year. It didn't hurt last year. And I think I got the high dose because I know it hurts more. Um, well, you didn't measure that in terms of, because I think there's been some classic work that, that analyzed those that had perceived thought they knew mm -hmm. versus those that, those that did not, that claimed they did not know. And indeed, within those two subgroups, they had different overall marginal averages. So it, it would be curious to know how that impacted. Greg. I wanted to, you know, thinking a little more about the, the outcome ascertainment question. I mean, what we heard, some, some, I, I thought some very insightful comments about, well, there's a difference between those things which might be more objectively measured and more subjectively measured, but mm, maybe we have to be careful because those objectively measured things, the question is, were they actually measured? If they were measured, they might have been measured objectively, but there might be some influence of expectations or preferences on whether they were measured which then got me back to thinking about, you know, the discussion this morning about, you know, the one thing that measures everything objectively all the time is your phone. Um, 
So I guess the, you know, the question would be, this is a question for John or for anybody else, but you know, you know, this is after the fact and probably wasn't even conceivable at the time you were doing this, but if you said, our outcome is gonna be one of those activity heat maps we saw this morning, um, because we're just gonna ask everybody's phone. We're not gonna wait for them to go to the doctor and say they had an exacerbation. We're just interested in how much they moved around every day, because we think that's just an incredibly valuable, I'm, I'm making this up, but that's an incredibly accurate indicator of their respiratory health, which is measured you know, on everybody every day without fail by a machine that doesn't care what the intervention assignment was. Would that solve the problem, you think? Would it solve the problem? I don't think so, but it would give you more information. So there was a, just a, an analogy. There was a, a, we did a study kind of in it, trying to look at innovation study in the rheumatoid arthritis space using iPhones. Um, as part of it, we used the iPhone as a, to, for them to fill out a PRO, and in the co same context, their agility to use the iPhone to fill out the PRO was assessing a little bit of the dexterity within the, this arthritis piece. So I think it's, it's a similar thing to what you're describing and, and giving us almost a quantification of that. So yes, it gives us more information. I'm, I'm just not sure it solves the problem. But let's come back to the, the purpose of blinding, right? So we're saying that how much could patient or provider expectations alter the results? And now we've had some interesting examples of, of cardiovascular outcomes, and I wanted to see if we could find out more about your vaccine study, because I thought you said it was cardiovascular outcomes, and I wonder how much major adverse coronary events can be influenced by your perception. So I think, you know, dead is dead. I, I think that's pretty, <laughs> I feel confident in that. Not that I can measure it that well, but once I, you know, once we know, we, I don't think the treatment assignment will influence your ascertainment. And then we talked about admissions for coronary events and in our prep sessions we were discussing, well, you might be more likely to go uh, to the hospital knowing your treatment. But to me, um, that's the difference between your admission diagnosis and your discharge diagnosis. You're going to get a workup. And I, I like to think there's something overly objective about coming to a diagnosis or not. So I, I accept the arguments that you might be wrong, but I, I'm not convinced that you're that far wrong, that you're going to say somebody came to the hospital and they absolutely didn't have a cardiac event when they did. I think that's what we have to keep putting back into, into perspective. I guess I, I will just say that dead is dead, but how you become dead, <laughs> there's a lot that can go on in between. And, and I think that's the important element is if you did no treatment, because I think this is fundamental to why blinding made sense in this circumstance, because it was a hospitalization study where it wasn't just if you got the flu. There, if, to me, if it was did you get, did you have a case of influenza, that almost could be an open label where you got the shot, you got the shot, and then you, and then you got the flu. But since hospitalization and there was this cardiovascular endpoint, if you did perceive that, you, that it was inferior, perhaps you do go get more care. Perhaps you are more likely. And so I think that it's important in that regard because of the outcome. And that's what actually made the difference between it being important to conceal allocation or not. But this, but, but, yeah. but what your argument, your, they're not argument, but taking both sides, I think tells you how difficult this decision is because they're probably both right um, and they're probably both wrong. And we have, there's a million other factors that are in there, including the fact that well, I'm interested in the fact that you give one, one immunization. So does, does that bias actually go away after three weeks when they've just completely forgot what it's on? And so then it is very much if they had a heart attack, they had a heart attack and, and that. So it, it's so gray. That's why I think it's going to be very difficult to have a, a number or a black and white answer. I think it was Alex and then Sorry. more like 
So, uh, yeah, on, on, this, on this general issue, uh, I think it's important to remember that one of the reasons that you design a trial, is just think from the standpoint of a Bayesian for a second, you don't design the trial to address your own prior necessarily. You have to design a trial to address the priors of the other people who are going to be making judgments about whether to use your evidence or believe it. And the more assumptions that you have going in about what the underlying model and mechanism is and, and things like that, the more pathways you allow then for doubt to creep in on the part of other people who maybe don't share your view of what the underlying causal space looks like. And this just happens to be an area where we are fundamentally wrong about what that space looks like more often than we're right. I just wanted to touch on what was uh, mentioned regarding the, the diagnosis and the objectivity of hospitalization. And I think in the cardiac space, especially now, there is a huge um, amount of variability, or there can be, between, say, a, a patient with heart failure that um, is hospitalized or is not in an era where we are penalized for putting people in the hospital after they were just hospitalized, then if, if a person, if we know what the person is on, are we more or less likely to have them stay home, I'm going to treat you this way, but instead of going to the hospital versus going to the hospital? I think that uncertainty um, it makes me uncomfortable. Uh, thanks. I have a, a, a I think, a, a relevant question here about not so much blinding but unblinding. Uh, at what time in the future after a trial or after participating in research can a patient be unblinded? In other words, find out what treatment they did get. Uh, and th this is a, maybe a HIPAA question and maybe a, a CLIA question uh, as well as maybe just an ethical one. But the, uh, if indeed patients are entitled to their own information, as they are, uh, that does include patient-specific data from research, as I understand it, unless there's some reason for accepting it. The exceptions to HIPAA are psychological or psychiatric notes, this kind of thing. Uh, at what point, if, if patients are collecting more and more of their own data, they can get their patient-specific data from a trial, can they take... <laughs> Can they be told that they took a placebo, even though, as far as they're concerned, it was a wonderful experience and they, they had positive outcomes? Has anyone looked at this sort of issue? Um, that's my question. I'm, I'm not sure of the other companies, but I, I believe that, that uh, you know, f first of all, for, let me, I guess, make the statement that for this, Forum, I think the outcome's already made, so the discussion uh, isn't part of the outcome kind of piece. Um, from a, from an ethical perspective, then I think we're probably moving from a place where they didn't, weren't able to understand what they were to a place in which they're probably going to have the patient's right to have be to be in the know. Nancy. Can I change the subject? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. You know, we, we were talking about before, to bring back to a point that you were raising, about um, how a patient might be managed differently knowing their treatment. So it might be more likely to hospitalize them or not. We haven't talked as a group about the flip side of that, and the, which is how a physician manages a patient when they don't know. He or she doesn't know what the treatment is. So I don't think we've talked yet about the balancing risks, or do we need to balance that risk and how much might that be? So I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be checking for because I don't know what you're being treated for. So I think that actually uh, handicaps the medical care that you can give. So I wonder about that. I also wonder about the additional uh, risks to patients by undergoing study procedures that wouldn't apply to them because they're not taking the active drug. I mean, it was, I love the sham surgery examples, but, and if you stand behind a screen, do a little voodoo, a little machination, scratch their leg, that's one thing, but I'm not sure that's a full, and I didn't know this, this study, but a full sham surgery is, is not a small risk to a patient. And we were talking about you know, treatments where you had to dr drill a hole in the skull. I mean, I think that, that uh, we have to consider 
those risks that we're imposing to the patient um, in back in that context of how big or small effect are we looking to see how much difference will something make and are we willing to add risks to the patient and hinder the ability of their providers to care for them by that lack of knowledge so we haven't really uh, added that into our decision criteria and i think it's important You raise, you raise a lot of issues. I, I think I, the only thing I would say about, um, uh, I think we have to think carefully about whether regularizing, so any, any well-done clinical trial should, the, the, the course of care that people are going to receive in either arm should be, you know, well-detailed and, and clinically acceptable. Um, and, uh, and then there really is a question about the degree to which um, you know, clinicians are able to look into the matrix and say, oh, you know, you, you are, you're an individual, you have these features that have, of, you know, that are unique, never been studied in any clinical trial, and I can compose the unique care that's best for you, uh, deviating from whatever protocol would be. And there's a lot of evidence, actually, that, you know, decision algorithms that are generated from very simple regressions do really, really well and often better than variations that clinicians introduce. So I think we just have to be circumspect when we think about the dangers of regularizing care to the dangers of not regularizing care, because that's part of what we're supposed to be doing in, in evidence-based medicine. Hi, Rob Reynolds from Pfizer. So just kind of going along the same line of um, discussion, how, how real are trials then that use concealment? And it's kind of going to Nancy's point. And how, how much do we believe that we can actually operationally conduct studies in broad patient populations, in sites that aren't in tertiary care centers, et cetera, when we use concealment? And because I, I feel like we're kind of skipping around that issue, but if we're thinking about either highly simplified trials like we, we heard about earlier today or, or various pragmatic designs um, or maybe the simplest sort of randomized design where we don't have concealment and we do it in a, in a healthcare, a large healthcare system and we do it rapidly, et cetera. So how do we balance that out and, and what is actually feasible? I would take that question, Rob, and change it um, or address it in the context of generalizability because we can, a lot of things are feasible if you spend enough money, and as a CRO, I'd say, go ahead, knock yourself out. But the, but the bigger point is, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> the bigger point is, is, what do you get for that? So when, when, we, when we do studies where you use concealment, we go, always go to the sites that are most likely able to do that. So they're generally academic centers. They're so, you know, we talked about whether a patient would be admitted, but not the kind of facility they would be admitted to and the kind of care you get when you're in that hospital. So I think what we get is estimates that aren't broadly generalizable <laughs> because of the quality of the care and the quality of the facility, the context, which is where we, Brandy, which is where we started the conversations this morning. I think that's extremely important, and we lose that thinking that we've made this ideal experiment and it will be generalizable because the factors that make it generalizable we didn't measure. I think that I think it depends. I mean, going to Greg's, it, it, it depends, but it depends. Um, it depends on what you're studying and whether, and I think that's where we were trying from a group to get this decision analysis kind of piece there is, is to try and come up with the factors that determine how it depends and whether we think that blinding will impact the nature of the answer or blinding will not impact, you know, and that, and if we can come up with those factors and drive us one way or another, I think we'd all be, be better off. Because in some cases, I think you can absolutely blind and have a real world outcome. And in some cases, I don't think you can blind and have a real world outcome. Um, one, one more question. I, this probably would you know, start with Alex, but I'd be interested in other people's thoughts about this. Um, you know, is there a qualitative difference between um, expectations and preferences? 
So, you know, an expectation, you know, the famous Yogi Bearism, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. I mean, an, an expectation has a high likelihood of being wrong and is changeable. A preference, maybe less so. You know, if someone says, yeah, I'd rather take a pill than have a shot, or I'd rather a pill you only have to take once a day or three times a day. So would we have a qualitatively different thing when we're talking about letting expectations play out versus preferences play out? I don't know about whether there's how much sense it makes to really draw a fine distinction between those two things. I, I, I think I would say most um, decisions providers and you know patients uh, are going to make are probably a, a bunch of trade-offs. And so there's real question: How much bang for my buck am I going to get by undergoing something that I have to take twice a day as opposed to once a day? You know, what 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 a, you know am I risking efficacious versus not efficacious? Um, you know, is it that I, I might be sick for a couple more days? You know, I mean, I think people's preferences can be really granular, and then there can be people who are like, I won't have a surgery under any. You know, I just I just won't I won't have surgery. So I, that, I but I think that diversity. And their malleability with education, right? That you know, if you say, look, that you know, th these are really the benefits you get out of this uh, out of this therapy. Um, I think that makes it very difficult to try to thread the needle through your estimate of what the preferences of of that population look like. But I also think it. I, I hate to keep saying it depends, but when you think about the context that you're dis, you know putting all of this in. I mean, we all know that in a context where there's fewer therapeutic options, there's, you know, if, if the sicker you are, the more you're going to want, to, the more you're going to take advantage of whatever the research infrastructure, the risk is. And so when we, if we move down the line a little bit and there's lots of other options and, um, you know, the p patients, providers, whatever, are going to be less likely to want to deal with the rigors of having the perfect study. So again, trying to think about this, it's hard to think about these things in a vacuum. One really has to think about it in the context of where one is in the, in the, in the life cycle of a, a product, what else is out there. I mean, we've, I mean, I think we've been talking about this in, along the way. I mean, all of these things are, are coming up, but to, it's hard to think about these in a vacuum in the absence of putting into context what we're trying to do with it. I'd like to just pick up on a word that Alex said, and that's trade-off. So a lot of times that we talk about patient preferences, but I do kind of think that it's it's more often than not, it's it's really trade-offs, right? I mean, l l let's say one were to do a study of two drugs that are equally effective. One, you have to, it's a home therapy, it's an oral tablet, you take it once a day, side effects are reasonable. The other is an injectable therapy, but you have to go to your doctor once a month to take it. Well, patients might have different trade-offs, right, about whether or not they want to do everything themselves at home or whether, hey, if I only got to do it once a month, I don't mind going to the doctor. But let's say that's in a clinical trial environment where all the drug supply is paid for, right? And then you leave the clinical trial environment, and now there's far different copays for these two therapies. Well, now it's a whole different ballgame. Because now patients then have new set of trade-offs. It's not only these two administration methods, but now it's, gosh, there's now a financial piece. And how much is it worth to me for my preference, right? And so, so all of those overlays, I think, kind of fall into the, I'm already forgetting the word that you used, the utilization factors. Um, you know, all that comes into play. And, and, um, and I think it's, it's all important to consider. It's all important to study. It's all important to think about. Um, you know, part of my challenge from the FDA standpoint is how much of that will ultimately fall under our purview, you know, when it comes to drug labeling claims and, and that kind of thing. But that's not to say that those studies aren't important, but we need to think about the ramifications. So maybe with our sparse remaining moments, uh, we'll get to one of the questions we were issued is, so now that we've had that, this dialogue, would we change, add, modify any of, anything with the decision aid? We just... James, you want to just pick up on that? Let's move back down this way and wrap up. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know, but I don't know that that's actually, it, it plays into necessarily the, the blinding decision. 
Um, it, it might. I'd have to think more about that. But uh, I, I don't have any substantive edits at, at this point. Um, I, I, I would, I'd like to see the algorithm um, talk more about uh, how individual trials ought to be evaluated relative to what we know and the other studies that we're doing. Um, you know, the, I think if it, it, the, the Salford study, when you take it in the context of there were already two very standard randomized uh, placebo controlled or no sorry active active controlled trials and then there's this this additional study to me it makes it very different uh, the evaluation of that study than if if the idea was this was going to be one of the studies that we were going to, one of two studies we were going to use for regulatory approval so i'd like to see that f somehow uh, factored into the to the algorithm For the handout, the questions that we see on the handout, I'd like to suggest that the fourth one, how might concealing treatment allocations reduce bias? Well, I think we missed the word how much because we just talked about how and how much is what counts. And as I mentioned earlier, to me, these questions are really trying to get at what problem we're trying to solve, what are we trying to get into a study to make sure that we get the right answer, and I'm not, it, it's context, and I'm not sure that any decision aid can turn a non-methodologist into a methodologist, um, so to the extent that it depends on, on who we're actually, you know, who's actually addressing these questions, so from a methodological standpoint, I think it's, you know, I think it works because one knows what you're trying to get out of it. But to the extent that it's not aimed at a methodologist, I'm not sure it will come up with what you, what, what the intent is, so. So, so I think playing on a, on a couple of the pieces, I, I, I think it can be simplified maybe a little bit as, as a backgrounder to, you know, what is the question we're trying to answer and, and is there a relationship of the blinding to that? What do we know um, and whether that impacts our decision? But then, really, Nancy hit me with the how much. I think that is the critical question that isn't here and it's probably the much, how much goes across them all, which is how much does that impact in any way on each of these factors. Not does it, it's how much and does that then change your ability to assess that outcome? Well, outstanding. Thank you so much. I think uh, we'll reconvene at 3 p.m. for the next session. Thank all the speakers. Thank you.